Uh, so we're going to get started. It's a pleasure to have Daniel Bauman, uh, who's a postdoc at Harvard, uh, visiting us for, I think you're going to be here the whole week, right? Whole week. So he'll be around all week. If you guys want to talk to him, he'll be in the visitor office. Um, so. Okay, so And then amazingly, when one added this, that's, that's just the classical evolution of the inflaton field. Yeah, just like a ball rolling down the potential. Amazingly, if one studies quantum fluctuations around this homogeneous evolution, one finds that these quantum fluctuations produce, um, when evolved under gravity, produce the large scale structure that we see. Um, and so there are small fluctuations in the field that lead to a small local time delay of the end of inflation. And that local time delay 
gets imprinted into fluctuations in the energy density. Um, and another characteristic scale will be the, the distance that the, the infraton field evolves from the time when these fluctuations produce scales that are observable in the CMB and the time when inflation ends. Um, so that's a scale that the phi that describes the feed variation of the infraton field um, from early times to the end. That's going to be another important quantity um, in the rest of my talk. Okay, so inflation has been you know, incredibly successful terminologically in at describing the primordial universe, but, but basic fundamental questions remain. So I just listed three important questions here. You know, one is the question, what is the scale of field phi? Yeah, so at the moment, I just described it as a kind of order parameter that describes the time evolution of the energy density. But more fundamentally, what can ask, you know, is this field a fundamental scale of field or some more emergent degree of freedom, uh, some composite field? Um, and then um, a second order question would be to ask what's the precise shape of this infraton potential. At the moment, we just have, you know, we have different phenomenological proposals for what the shape could be. And each of these different shapes leads to slightly different predictions in the actual shape of the cosmological perturbations. Um, so from a top-down point of view, we would like to have some kind of theoretical input into um, expected shapes for these potential energy functions. Um, and you know, a big part of my talk is going to be what string theory can tell us about these potential energy functions. Um, and then finally, there's a question about initial conditions. Why this field starts off in this high energy state in the first place? And why doesn't the universe start in this, in this low energy um, ground state? So these are basic theoretical questions that remain unanswered. And I think we have to provide some kind of um, theoretical understanding of these kind of questions if you want to you know, consider it. Um, if you want to claim understanding the universe. Um, OK, so the outline of my talk is going to be I'm going to roughly try and have, keep my talk in two parts. The first talk, I'm going to um, make a couple of statements about inflation that I think are generic um, and hopefully uncontroversial. And those, so I'm going to try and emphasize aspects about inflation that depend on high scale physics. So typically one imagines that inflation is actually a mechanism that is almost designed to hide, hide the ultra-high energies from all of you. For example, it removes monopoles, so we don't see you know, high energy relics from very high energy physics. Um, but there are these three particular aspects of inflation that nonetheless are sensitive to you know, details, sometimes subtle details about our, the or, of our theories at the highest energy scales. And I'm going to describe generically what I think are um, three examples for such a sensitivity. Um, so one example is you know, protecting the flatness of the infraton potential, really ensuring that these potential, function, potential energy functions can arise with flat potentials. Um, um, the second question is the question about gravitational waves. Um, it turns out that inflationary models with a high gravitational wave amplitude are particularly sensitive to high energy interactions. Um, and then finally, a question about whether the, the fluctuations are truly Gaussian and what it would mean if you were to observe um, primordial non-Gaussian energy. So that hopefully will just be generic statements that I, I believe to be true 10 years from now. Um, and then in the second half of my talk, I'm going to provide just one case study of a model in, in, of inflation in string theory that um, where I feel these kind of questions have been addressed more carefully. Um, and so I'm going to point out you know, what one particular class of string inflation models has to, um, you know, what it says about these, these type of questions. Um, and in order to talk about this in some detail, I will have to give you some background. Um, and I will try to keep it minimal but and, and a little bit schematic. OK, so, so I want to start with my first talk, part um, in describing these three questions about inflation that depend on high energy physics. Um, OK, so the first, um, as I mentioned, in order to have a long period of accelerated expansion, the potential energy has to be very flat. Um, in other words, the energy density is, is looting very slowly. Um, and it turns out that, and, and as I said, this is parameterized by these slow growth parameters. And it turns out that these slow, slow, the values of these slow growth parameters are sensitive to um, dimension six planet suppressed operators. Yeah. So those are quantum corrections of the form you know, that, that I'm sketching here, where one basically has a correction for the infraton mass with some, with some mass parameter. And what one often finds in high energy theories is that this mass parameter is large when compared to the overall scale of the potential. Okay. And what that means is that this, such a correction can have a large effect on the 
So although one start, starts off with a potential that the zeroth order looks flat like this, say, um, when one actually considers corrections to the potential more often, you know, more often than not, one finds that the potential gets corrected with a large mass time. Right? So that goes by the name of the eta problem because the eta problem, that's, the eta parameter that starts off being small, gets corrected by an order, order one number. Um, and basically, inflation, you know, inflation spoils when one when, when one includes those corrections. With the ball huh? With the ball um, It turns, yeah. One, that, that's another. So typically, what ha what happens is that this parameter gets corrected before epsilon loses large corrections. So there are different versions of inflation where this pr problem is more or less apparent. Yeah? Um, so for example, in F, ter in F term supersymmetric models of inflation, this either problem is more apparent than, for, for example, say in D term models of That's why I don't like D term models. That's why some people like D term models better. But in, um, the model I'm going to present is actually an F term model of inflation when we use it from a supergraphic language. And therefore, this problem here can't be, can't be ignored. Um, what I'm saying is, it's worse without supersymmetry. It can be cured with supersymmetry. With supersymmetry, this might, yeah. Um, <coughs> the, actual, the actual point what I want to make is not, it, it, not whether um, this is an uncurable problem. Um, the point I want to make is actually, in order to decide whether there's a problem in the first place, one has to, one has to appeal to some higher, higher energy structure. So even if you know if you want to apply supersymmetry to the problem and, 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 and say um, argue that these terms are suppressed or absent, um, just from an effective field theory point of view, I can't, I can't make that argument. So I need to in order even to apply, yeah, in order to argue for the absence of these terms, I need to apply it to some higher kind of energy structure. What about even high derivatives? High derivatives? I'm going to come to that. High derivatives will affect non Gaussianity, and we'll also have to worry about including a UV completion of the. I think he means a field time, you mean what the field? Sorry? Higher? He means oh. higher potential. Higher derivative? Or oh, higher higher terms than quadratic? Okay, good. Um, I might come back to this because I'm Well, I'm gonna so so this is a zeroth order worry of just reproducing the background evolution of the universe, yeah? Just V of five. Actually in the next step I'm gonna talk about models which produce a large gravitational wave amplitude. It turns out that in those models, the field moves over a distance which is larger than vacuum. And then what it did has to worry about corrections that are come with, um, with higher powers of phi than just quadratic. So this is, a, this is, this is even worse in, in, in models where the field evolves over a large distance. Um, maybe in the back of my mind here, I have a small field model where phi is less than in Planck, and therefore these higher corrections are suppressed by Planck. So this will be the leading Planck suppressed correction. Um, so, but, but the basic point I just want to make is that in order to have a controlled model, one must understand all these contributions to the potential to a very high degree of accuracy. Okay? Basically, to one percent in the ether, to, to its contribution to the ether parameter. Yeah? So, one has to compute these mass parameters to one percent accuracy. And and then one one should be able to, to demonstrate explicitly that these dangerous terms are either absent for some reason, like maybe supersymmetry in ether inflation, um, or they're, su they're suppressed. So that this mass is actually, there's a good physical reason why this mass is not of order the, the only scale of the, pro in the problem, right? the scale of the potential problem. Or that there, 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 there are a number of these dangerous terms with opposite signs and you cancel by, by fine tuning. Yeah. Um, but the point is that it requires some knowledge of Planck scale physics to be able even to talk about these corrections in a, in a faithful way. So that's a basic point that's going to be important for the rest of the class <coughs> because I'm going to actually show a model. Um, of inflation in string theory, I think we can compute all of these effects and therefore really answer the question whether um, um, you know, this problem is generically present or not, or whether it can be solved by fine tuning. Okay, so the sec second, second feature of inflationary models that is UV sensitive is, is in some sense optional because it doesn't apply to all models. Yeah? But it turns out that models that produce a large gravitational wave amplitude um, are particularly UV sensitive. So it turns out that there's a famous result due to life, because it's derived in a couple of lines, um, that this total field variation of the inflaton field delta phi is, 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 is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the amplitude of gravitational waves. Yeah. So often this amplitude of gravitational waves, waves is normalized with respect to the scalar fluctuations, and one then talks about this tensor to scalar ratio. Um, and so if one compares the tensor to scalar ratio to the total field evolution of the field, 
from the time when CMD scales were created to the end of inflation, one gets this, this correspondence. So it turns out if the tensor amplitude, the tensor scalar ratio is bigger than 1%, then the field had to evolve for more than a factor. Um, and then the challenge is to ensure that these two parameters remain small over a large distance in field space. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and so what I, what I now want to demonstrate is actually whether that's a problem or not depends on your assumption about the UV limit of the, of the theory. Yeah. So if one were to assume for the moment that there's no shift symmetry in the UV, then it's natural to write down an effective field theory with some cut of lambda that is less than in time and one ha would have this infinite series of correction terms yeah? with coefficients that are generically just a order of one. Yeah? And then for particular examples, one, one could find whether this, one could test whether this effective Lagrangian appears and what these coefficients are in practice. But just from a, from a um, effective field, well, it's only an effective field theory type of analysis, one would have to write down these, these correction terms. Term two. Ah, yeah, yeah, I'm imposing a, a symmetry on the phi to minus phi. This is the, not the most general thing yet. Um, okay, so this is an effective field theory, no shift symmetry in the UV, but a, a Z2 symmetry, phi to minus phi. Yeah. If I'm worried, but this, this is, yeah, it's not important for the argument at all. Um, but the, the, the point is that these, these corrections here are suppressed by, by this cut of scale lambda, and this cut of scale lambda one can show always has to be less than a flag. Um, and these coefficients here are generically of order one, so what it means is that, um, in order to get inflation over a distance that is larger than a flag, one needs to somehow arrange that these, these coefficients cancel against each other. Okay. So that means there's a functional fine tuning of all correction terms to make these corrections irrelevant to your inflation. Um, and so, so compare this to the first problem I was talking about, the, the, the ether problem, which only requires fine tuning of one mass parameter. Whereas here one has to fine tune an infinite number of terms against, against each other. Um, but of course, there's a, there's a simple solution to this problem if the UV theory indeed has a shift symmetry. So if this Lagrangian is, is required to be invariant on the phi to minus phi, and this, this shift symmetry is only weakly broken by the inflaton potential itself, by like a mass term, for example, um, then it's technically natural to actually write down such a Lagrangian with a small mass. Um, so, then, so, so under this assumption, which I'm not, playing, which I'm not saying that it's a strong or weak assumption, on that assumption, um, this Lagrangian is technically natural. Um, but the interesting point is if you measure gravity waves, it will actually tell us you know, a qualitative, you know, qualitative statement. It will make a qualitative statement about one of this, this assumption about symmetry in the UV. Yeah. That's, the, that's the basic point. Of that. Okay, so then the final point is that um, is the question of whether the inflationary fluctuations are Gaussian. And non-Gaussianity, quite generally, is just a measure of interactions of the inflaton field. Um, so in particular, in the simplest models of inflation, single field slow roll, yeah, one starts with a Lagrangian like this. So one has a canonical kinetic term and a potential. And then in order to get inflation in the first place, the, the, the potential has to be flat, which means that self-interactions of the inflaton field are necessarily small, just in order to ensure that inflationary dynamics occurs in the first place. Um, and then what, th what that means is that this F and L parameter, which parameterizes the amount, the amount of nonlinearity, um, is suppressed by, by slow growth parameters. So that's now a famous result that this F and L parameter is much less than one. Um, and current observational bounds on F and L are order, um, order of you know, tens or hundreds. And order one is probably also the best one can hope to measure with, with future CMB and large scale structure observations. So in single field slow roll uh, models here, there's this robust result that interactions have to be small in order to allow inflation, therefore number of CIP is small. Um, but then of course, you know, nothing forbids you from, from studying more general single field inflation models, <coughs> where one postulates that inflation is covered by a Lagrangian with some, uh, that is a, some arbitrary function of some of, of a kinetic term. And one can then show that non-Gaussianity can indeed be large if these high derivative interactions are important during inflation. But for example, Cremonelli studied you know, the, the leading higher derivative interaction for our correction to the, to the slow growth Lagrangian. And what he found is that this F and L parameter indeed scales as um, the kinetic energy of the inflaton field over this color scale. But again, what you find is in order for this F and L parameter to be large, um, this kinetic energy has to be of order the color scale. 
but it should then worry about all these other higher derivative corrections that I have that, that I have ignored. Yeah. So non Gaussianity indeed only can be large if there's a, there's an infinite series of higher derivative interactions and all simultaneously are pointing for the dynamics. Um, and then the question arises how does one actually sum this 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 series of higher derivative interactions. So that again cries out for like a a, a, um, a higher level UV analysis of the and for example, one example of such a UV analysis is what's called EDI inflation, yeah. um, where inflation, in fact, is governed not by a simple, simple Svorov Lagrangian, but by a more, more complicated kinetic term. Um, so, so notice that this kinetic term is pretty, um, is very analogous to the Lagrangian for a relativistic point particle, and that's effectively what it is. It, it's the relativistic Lagrangian for a three-dimensional brain. Yeah. Um, but that's not important here now. If you just accept this as an effective Lagrangian, then it, it teaches you that inflation can actually occur for steep potentials. And interactions are important but controlled because this, 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 this Lagrangian is known to hold at arbitrary of high energies. Um, and it turns out that the same interactions that allow inflation for steep potentials also allow it to have a large non Gaussianity. Okay. And typically, very large non Gaussianity in saturating current bounds. Um, so the three, point, three points I wanted to make is that the eta problem, <coughs> gravitational waves, and primordial non Gaussianity are UV-sensitive aspects of inflation. Um, and each of these problems actually teaches us that we require some UV completion to have theoretical control. Yeah. Um, so the first, the first problem, of course, is generic, where the, where the second two might be forced on, on us by observations, but at present, you know, in some sense, optional. There's no problem having a model of inflation with low gravitational wave amplitude and low non gaussianity But if any of these two things were to observe, were to be observed, then we would have to really um, more seriously worry about and how this is understood in the context of high energy theory. Okay, so what I want to do in the rest of my talk is basically give a case study of one particular um, model of inflation in string theory where these questions have been addressed. Um, Carefully, and I'm going to explain how this this model of what deep brain inflation addresses each of these three aspects in, in one single unified framework. Um, or maybe I should stop here and ask if there's any question. Is there a general argument about you know aside from DBI, if I'm just resetting an infinite series of first derivatives of the field, right? Where, you know, I have 500 powers of the first derivative. Is there any general argument why I shouldn't get that? Because um, you typically really do have those terms. Yeah, even for, even for the DBI, you could worry about high, you know, more than one derivative acting on the field. Um, yeah. DBI, the, 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 um, the argument actually that I'm looking at at the moment, you know, that these, these accelerations are small relative to the velocities um, <coughs> but when evaluated on the background solution. But it's an, it's an yeah, important consistency yeah, check that one has yeah. to do afterwards. Yeah, it's, um, it's first off, it's a posterior. Yeah, yeah. Second off, there's sort of, there are counter examples like the folded brain stuff that the length and collaborators work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not, uh, yeah. Okay, that's true. So, so a Lagrangian, just depending on the, on the kinetic time, uh, as you're saying, is not the most general Lagrangian with high derivative interaction. That's true. Yeah. So there's no, there's no, no both here. I don't know. So in that, uh, do you consider supergravity models by deep neural inflation as UV complete, or how um, do they come from the string theory that we can be UV complete? So I'm saying that we can solve many problems which you started before with the supergravity construction back 10 years ago without string theory. By postulating some scalable problem. It would still be nice to see that these scalar potentials arise from string theory, say, because it is true what can arbitrarily introduce shift symmetries into the scalar potential, um, and then these shift symmetries will propagate down into shift, shift symmetries in the, in the what, scalar what, potential. But what, what, what happens in reality is string theory is so uncertain, and there's so many corners of landscape, you can, uh, in the supergravity limit, get 
But I haven't, for example, I haven't seen the supergravity Lagrangian that, that you're referring to. Coming from the theory. So maybe I should mention for everybody else, supergravity is a low energy limit of string theory. So um, it's, a, it's an effective theory, a theory that would arise from string theory at energies below the, below the string scale. It's bigger than that. But some version of it. All these low energy limits of string theory are supergravity qualities. But there are more supergravity constructions. So what I want to do in the second half is talk in some <coughs> detail about a particular case, a particular model of inflation string theory, not, but not necessarily the only one. Um, and the, the way I've selected that one is, of course, is because it's the one I've, I've worked on more, caref more carefully. Um, but it's also the one where, yeah, you can correct me if you don't agree, but it's, it's the one where I think we could make these, these calculations in, in the most detail. And, um, and it would be interesting to, to, to develop the machinery to do these calculations for other types of models. So I'm not advocating this as a particularly beautiful construction by any means. Um, so the outline for the second half is I want to make some generic, some general statements about string inflation that are true for most of these models, mostly not all. I want to then actually give you the geometrical setup that is relevant for these warp d brain inflation models. And then in passing, I will mention how, this, how the geometry affects these three be sensitive observables for inflation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a recent paper that came out a few weeks ago um, about how we found a systematic way of computing all important corrections to what we think are all important corrections to this potential energy function for that model. Um, and I'm going to make some comments about what those corrections imply for the phenomenology of, of brain inflation. Um, and again, I've tried to give enough background to make you be able you know, to follow the, 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 the setup, but if I'm leaving anything, I'm going to stop me and just ask me. Um, so I already <coughs> mentioned, you know, this, you, I think these, UV, these three UV-sensitive aspects of inflation are strong motivation for actually studying inflation in the context of string theory. And even simpler motivation is that, you know, of course, in the standard model of particle physics, we don't know of a scalar field that can be the infotop field. Um, whereas in string theory, these scalar fields appear very naturally. And in fact, you know, there's even the problem that too many scalar fields appear, and one usually has to appeal to, um, to, to more complicated physics in order to hide those scalar fields from our view. And I'm going to describe that also. Um, and also, string theory com provides considerable UV control. So you get complete Lagrangian that tells you about um, what happens to these high derivative interactions at, um, at, at, you know, at a scale close to the cutoff. Um, and it also tells you in more detail what happens to corrections to the inflation potential, or which corrections should be should be present and included. Um, so then the hope is to use string theory to clarify some of these UV issues of inflation, and in reverse to use cos cosmological observations maybe to constrain um, string theory models of inflation. But as you know, as Lev was pointing out, that's that's challenging because they like you know, there might be many of them or not. Okay, so the first concept that we will need is the concept of moduli fields. Um, so moduli fields arise when, you know, as, you, as, you, as you surely heard, string theory is defined in 10 dimensions, 10 or 11. You need to compactify six of them. Um, <coughs> and it turns out when you compactify space dimensions, um, from a four-dimensional point of view, these appear as scalar fields. Yeah. So the simplest example is, is just the overall volume of the extra dimensions. Yeah. If the overall volume of the extra dimensions were to change in time, would be dynamic, but we would actually see, we would see that. Yeah? We would see that as an additional force, we would see that as a change in Newton's constant, a change in coupling constants. Um, so, so, typic so typically, um, yeah, and so that's, that, that's one example of a scalar field. Other examples are roughly, the, the, you know, an anal analogous, an are, the, are the shape of extra dimensions. Yeah? Um, so roughly the shape and size of extra dimensions appear as four-dimensional scalar fields. And those scalar fields can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, so they might be a blessing if, um, because as I mentioned, of course, we need scalar fields both for inflation and maybe for dark energy. Um, so if these scalar fields have the right kind of physical characteristics to give you flat potential functions, um, 
then that might be a natural way to, to link inflation to, to some high energy, more energy structure. Um, but they can be a curse because if they don't serve a useful purpose, then they use, usually they are dangerous. Yeah? Um, and um, so that's, that's why modular fields typically sp split into two, two types. Yeah? The first type is you know, scalar fields that are useful for cosmological purposes and scalar fields that are not useful. And the ones that are not useful, you would like to hide from our view. And you do that by the process of, of modular stabilization. Yeah? So you fix the size of the exit dimensions. Um, OK, a couple of other. Um, A couple of other basic, basic structures that I have to give. String theory naturally has D brains, so those are higher dimensional membranes over which strings can end. They also have fluxes, yeah? Those are generalizations of electric and magnetic fields, higher dimensional versions of electric and magnetic fields, yeah? So don't, just like a, po a charged point particle you know, creates electric and magnetic fields, those higher dimensional brains create electric and magnetic fluxes. Um, and then these fluxes can back react on the geometry and produce a warping of the exoplanet. So the exodimensions can be can be curved rather than flat. But you see that these these three important elements are all linked to each other. <coughs> so they're not added to the theory you know, in an arbitrary way, but they're they, you know like deep brains arise for detailed mathematical and physical consistency reasons, and then these flux, these deep brains source fluxes, and the fluxes source the warping of the exodimensions. Yeah? So the idea would then be to use these features to first of all stabilize all moduli except maybe a few. And then study whether those few remaining moduli fields can play um, the role of the scalar field phi. And then one would ultimately like to compute this function of V of phi from a microscopic point of view. Um, okay, so there are different versions, different types of physics that allow you to stabilize the extra dimensions, so stabilize these moduli. And one of the most popular ones is goes by the name of KKLT. And so in their scenario, the extra dimensions are stabilized by a combination of fluxes and, and D-brains. And roughly what happens is that the fluxes fix the overall shape, yeah? so that the extra dimensions are not allowed to twist, to twist anymore. And the fluxes also lead to a strong, as I mentioned, to a strong warping of the space time. And then additional wrapped brains fix the overall size of the extra dimensions. Yeah? So that you end up with a compactification manifold which is completely rigid. Yeah? If, you know, if you have these physical effects. And the rough cartoon version of this is, is something like this, where this is a six-dimensional compact space. You know, their brains wrapping lower dimensional cycles of that compact space, and their fluxes that thread, um, thread, <coughs> thread these cycles. And then energy densities associated with each objects that allow you to write out potentials for this one. Do you think it was just a solution of the 10-dimensional Einstein equations with all the sources? Yeah. So this is the cartoon version. What Lev was saying is a more mathematical description, and it's it's really a phys you know it's a physical kind of calculation. Um, it's a solution of Einstein equations with sources. Stable solutions with negative classes. Well, classic classic was two. But a stable uh, under the citizen. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but once you try to lift it to, to, to a positive cosmological concept, it is not stable. Um, okay. Um, so that challenge has recently be, be, been overcome that you actually stabilize most of these modified fields. And by recent, I mean something like five years ago. Um, so people, of course, were studying the early universe in the context of string theory before that, but before that, they really always had to make a strong assumption that somehow these extra dimensions don't evolve dynamically, and they're fixed by, by assumption, in some sense. Yeah? And now, actually, that assumption has been removed, and there's actually a physi physically well-motivated um, mechanism that allows it to show that this actually happens in, in detail. Um, so that was a major development, and from then on, you know, you can actually now in more detail, study what happens with any modular field that isn't stabilized, isn't fixed, so that modular field is allowed to evolve dynamically. And roughly, you have two qualitative possibilities. There's the possibility that the extra dimensions themselves somehow still slowly change, change in time. Yeah. That, in fact, they haven't fixed completely the size, but you allow it to change very slowly. Um, or there's the possibility that you have some extra energy density that moves through the extra dimension. 
And both of these effects from a four-dimensional point of view would look like a changing energy density. And the quite detailed, detailed computational question is just whether any of these kind of effects can, can lead to an energy density that, that changes slow enough. Um, so, um, so these are just you know, a, few of the, um, a few of the examples of each of these types of models that have been constructed. You know, some of which LEV has been involved, like roulette inflation um, or racetrack inflation. And the one I want to focus on is this, this example of <coughs> warped brain and their brain inflation. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background about deep brain inflation. Um, so the basic geometrical idea is that you have a brain and an anti brain. Yeah. They're both three dimensional objects, um, so they fill four dimensional space time. So their world volume extends along all four dimensions, but they're separated by an extra dimension. Yeah. So this coordinate here, this coordinate here is our three plus one dimensional world. Um, so we will be, we will be, these brains would coincide with our world, but then they're separated by an extra dimension. So from the extra dimension point of view, they simply look like point particles. Yeah. Um, so and and what I'm in fact going to do in every every cartoon that follows is I'm going to suppress the three plus one. So all pictures that I'm going to show are simply going to be pictures in from the point of view of the extra dimensions. And then these three brains will look like point particles. Um, and the idea is that the, the role of the inflaton field is placed by, played by the separation between those two points. And in order to, ask in, to, in order to answer the question whether the system can be inflating or not, one has to uh, compute what the force between those two objects is, <coughs> and whether that force can be weak enough or not. Daniel, is an intelligent answer why this should be parallel? Why it should be parallel? Um, there's a little bit, yeah, there's a bit, there is an answer. Um, well, I can give you the answer that Henry Ty likes to give. You might have heard before, if not, yeah. Um, so I think the answer that he gives is that even if those, those things are, say, say imagining that these are, these are wiggled and intersecting, maybe, um, if they're wiggled and intersecting, then it's very, then they're gradient contributions to the, to the effective potential. And these gradient contributions will typically, dis you know, prevent inflation from occurring. But there will be small, re you know, there will be small patches where, by chance, those things are parallel, and those patches will inflate and go. So this is the this is this is the the blown up version of that small region. So it's, it's, the same answer. it's an initial conditions problem, though. It's right. basically the same answer. What happens with the patch of the stellar field? What your simulation is working is became more and more. Yeah, you can study when you add gradient energy uh, to uh, make a slightly inhomogeneous. Universe. And then there's also constraint about how much the gradients you're allowed to add. Um, okay. Um, okay, and so that's the video of how inflation would occur. Oh. Okay, so this goes back to, I think, 96 due to Bali and Thai. Um, and what they studied is they basically studied this system in, in a flat background space time. The extra dimensions were flat, they were on curve, yeah, so they didn't have the curvature that naturally arises from these fluxes. Um, but it was simply a brain and anti-brain sitting, say, on a torus. Yeah. And then they asked, you know, what's the force between those two objects? And of course, naturally, the further you separate them, the weaker the force. So what you might imagine is that at least as you separate them by a large distance, um, at some distance, you know, the force is weak enough so that inflation can occur. But what they found is that this, this separation, in fact, has to be bigger than the overall size of the extra dimensions. So in fact, you have to separate these objects by more, more space than you have available. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, what they found is they found a serious ether problem for this, for this model in flat space. Yeah. So in flat space, you can prove easily that this thing doesn't, does never inflate. Um, but then um, what happened next is that um, these authors, KKL MMT, the same authors as, as in KKLT, with Maldacena and McAllister at it, um, what they studied is they studied the natural scenario when these two brains are embedded not into a flat space but into a curved space. And it turns out that this cur curvature has the effect that it suppresses the force between them. Yeah. So that to, um, to zero order, when one simply computes the, the, the charge interaction basically between those two point particles, um, that charge interaction will produce a potential that is exponentially flat, even at small distances. Yeah. Um, simply by just warping the warping effect. Warping just suppresses the force. Um, yeah. um, okay, so this is what I mentioned already: the warping suppressed. So the advantage, is, the advantage of studying the system in such a warped throat 
Yeah, so that's also called a warped throat, come back to the region. Um, so the advantage of looking at the system in, in, a, in a warped region is that it suppresses the force between the brains. And a second important advantage is that in fact there are explicit solutions. Yeah? Explicit metrics are actually known for these warped regions. Yeah? Which is unlike most extra-dimensional spaces in string theory and actually doesn't know the metric. Yeah? But only knows some you know, more, more basic topological statements like you know, number of holes, number of... Yeah? Um, but one doesn't have detailed metric information. Whereas in these, in these throat regions, one actually knows explicit metric, at least locally, yeah, explicit metric, at least locally. And the metric actually allows you to, to then compute gravitational um, interactions and things like that. Yeah. So that's an important feature that makes these you know, useful lampposts in some sense to study, to study that um, And so, so I should also explain what I mean by this picture a little bit more. So this, this picture is meant to be a six-dimensional space yeah? um, in, like a, in like a rough two-dimensional representation. Um, so here, this direction is meant to be a radial direction. And then at every radial point, there's a five-dimensional base. Yeah? So this part here is, has, has the geometry of a cone. Yeah? So at every radial position, you can imagine just a five-dimensional base, base category. And in the simplest example, you might imagine just a five-dimensional sphere. Um, in more reali re realistic examples, you know, that base manifold has a more complicated structure. Yeah. Um, okay, but the basic geometry is set up a cone, and then that cone is attached to a, some very complicated extra, extra manifold. Yeah. Um, okay. But we are always going to study physics in that local, locally um, simple, simple geometry in some sense. Yeah. So here, again, here I'm just showing this, this cone structure. Um, so this cone has a minimal radius and a maximal radius. Yeah? And so the first thing one can actually do, it wasn't the first thing that was done, but one thing that one can do, is one can actually compute how far the infraton field can move just in that geometrical region. Yeah? And so when one normalizes these things properly, one actually finds that there's a strict upper bound <coughs> in the total variation of the infraton field yeah? in canonical units relative to the Planck mass. Yeah? And and in fact, it turns out that the field can never travel over a super black in this case. And, okay. So in this case, it's related to the fact that the, uh, the size of the extra dimensions, you know, the arbitrary, is related to the Planck uh, and mass. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. So this, this is actually what I like about the argument, so maybe I say a few more, more words about it. I wanted to cut this short because it's not the main point. But it's, it's an important point, actually. So because it's a little bit counterintuitive, you might imagine that I could just make this throat longer and longer, arbitrarily big. So then I get more and more radial distance, and the infraton field should have more and more space to, to evolve in. But what actually happens is that as I make the compact space larger, uh, the, comp the, 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 the size of the compactification actually affects Newton's constant, or the Planck, the, this four-dimensional Planck mass. So in these kind of scenarios, the four-dimensional Planck mass is like an effective parameter that, ap that arises from um, a fixed high, high ten dimensional scale multiplied by this six, six dimensional volume. So as I make this volume bigger and bigger, the Planck mass also gets bigger and bigger. But what, what is relevant to four dimensional inflation is, you know, the field variation compared to the Planck to the Planck mass. So as I'm making the throat longer and longer, the Planck mass actually increases by more than the field space that I weigh. Yeah. So actually, to get a large field variation, it turns out you want to have a throat that is as small as possible. It's a little bit counterintuitive because in our minds we basically don't rescale the Planck mass. We just think about this linear, linear extent. But this Planck mass actually depends on all of six, on the six-dimensional volume, and the six-dimensional volume grows faster than this linear, linear volume. Um, so that's that's in, in, that's the gist of how we derive this, derive this bulk. But then I showed you earlier that life has this famous result that if this field variation is less than Planck, that means that the gravitational waves are always small. So here, by, for, from purely geometric arguments, one shows that gravitational waves can never be, can never be large. Um, and so notice that I didn't have to say anything about fine tuning. I didn't have to say, you know, like, that usually what the, the argument that gravitational waves, whether gravitational waves are large or small, it depends on, you know, the first derivative of the potential. One has to argue that it's very fine tuned or not to have a, have a, have a first derivative which is extremely tiny. Here we're basically just saying that for purely geometric reasons this can never, this can never happen. Yeah, so it actually, it, it's a much more basic argument than fine tuning. What's big N? Yeah, sorry. So big N is, is a, 
is an integer of the number that relates to the amount of flux that you need to produce such a one for each. It's related to R map. Yeah. Let me just say that it's, it's an integer number that always has to be bigger than one for any of this to make sense. Yeah. First of all, because it's an integer, so you can't start counting. It's the amount of flux that integer quantized flux that sources these storage regions. Um, so the smallest it can be is one. But one would be, it's a dubious case come because then the throat is so small that it's actually smaller than the string size. And when the throat is smaller than the string size, size then the geometry is not, in some sense, not classical anymore. So I couldn't be even drawing this picture. So I want this throat to be big enough such that corrections to the geometry are not important. <coughs> Um, and in order for that to be the case, the throat has to be big enough. And how big the throat is, is governed by the amount of flux that we use to create the throat. And that amount of flux is governed by this is integer n. Um, OK, good point. Um, OK, so now I can make a, a, a few more statements about the, the, the potential synergy <coughs> between the brain and the anti-brain. Um, so I mentioned that because of the warping, this, the, the force between the brain and the other brain is exponentially flat. So typically, the, the, the potential shape that one gets is something like this, um, where this, this axis here is a separation between the two brains. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I, and, and as the brains actually become very close, this, this actually doesn't, this, it looks as if this would be divergent and, non, not, and singular at the origin, but it turns out that's that's actually smoothed out by, by string attacks. Um, the important region of this potential is, is, is this region now, though. Yeah? So uh, if, the, um, if the brains are separated by a certain amount, you know, the, the force between them will be very weak, the potential will be very flat. Right? But that's only the zeroth order effect where I compute the direct interaction between the two and I ignore everything else and basically. Yeah? Um, but it turns out when one, when one includes the effects coming from the fact that the brains actually live in a compact space, then, then the brains will actually feel that the space is compacted. Yeah? They will feel that the, they're, sur they're surrounded by a finite space and they back react on the, ge on the geometry. And the geometry will tell them you know, that they actually they should feel a gravitational force as well. And that extra gravitational force, in fact, induces an order one correction to the ether parameter. Mm -hmm. So it's precisely of that type of correction that I was um, alluding to earlier. Yeah. So then instead of having a very flat potential, one in fact gets a steep. This is conformal coupling. This is conformal coupling. One way of doing this is this conformal coupling. Yeah. Um, the, the most physical way of yeah, we can, <coughs> the most physical way of doing this is that the brain back reacts on the on the on the volume, and the potential is only flat in string frame, where the volume is assumed to be fixed. But now the volume depends on where precisely the brain is sitting. So then when when one goes to Einstein frame and rescales the the volume, uh, the potential becomes dependent on where the, where the brain is sitting because of potential. Uh, because the volume changes. Um, okay, so this is, um, but then it was, all, and all of this was emphasized in this paper by Kate Kirk and And, but what they also said, it, what they also pointed out that this is only one possible effect coming from the model, from the extra dimensions. And if one includes other, you know, more detailed effects, one might hope that, you know, these, these, these different effects are all important and they might be able to cancel against each other. But at the time they were writing their paper, you know, there was actually no way of computing these other effects. Yeah? Um, um, so the only effects that could have been comp that was computed is this effect, and then it was speculated that extra effects might lead to a cancellation. Yeah? So then, of course, after their paper, you know, there were hundreds, of, hundreds of papers on string um, brain inflation. And but it's important to emphasize that all of these papers were basically assuming that this cancellation, you know, would eventually happen when one did compute these effects. Um, so what I want to present now is actually, I think, uh, the first systematic uh, computation of these extra corrections. And those, th that computation really was necessary in order to prove whether, prove a basic assumption of GIF that went into you know, all further work, I would say. Um, so the question is, can other compactification effects be important, and can they cancel against this generic effect that one has um, at first order? <coughs> Oh, and then also I can make just a quick aside on FNL. Um, so when one study these, studies these brains, one actually finds that the kinetic term for these brains is not simply a canonical kinetic term, but it has this square root feature. Um, just because, it, you know, this space, you know, and this is analogous to the square root feature that one gets when one studies a relativistic point particle. Yeah? One also has a square root of one minus x, x dot squared. Yeah. Um, 
So, so basically, this, this action has a non-relativistic limit, which is slow roll. Yeah? So for small speeds, when this derivative term here is small, one can actually expand this square, then we'll just find the slow roll around it. But it also has a relativistic limit where you know all terms, if one were to expand this square, all hadder terms are equally important. Um, but we actually, but in this example, we actually know how to sum these hydro derivative reactions. So we, there's a good physical reason why all these terms together will actually give you a square root. <coughs> yeah? And so in this relativistic limit, one can show that the speed of sound of fluctuations is small, and no Gaussian energy is in fact large. Yeah? Um, so that's the sense in which brain inflation addresses all three of these questions. First of all, it tells you that the field variation cannot be large geometrically. Um, it tells you that interaction terms can be, high derivative interactions can be controlled because you know, this, the UV limit of the kinetic term is known. Um, and it allows, it gives you a way of computing corrections to the, to the potential and, and address whether the ether problem is really an issue or not. Okay. So in the last half, last part of my talk, I got 10 more minutes or so. Yeah. So in the next 10 minutes, I want to sketch out this computation that we did in order to assess whether Corrections to the potential are important. Okay. Um, so let me just repeat the different contributions to the to the potential in some in a, some sense of a a cartoon version. Um, so the first first contribution that we looked at was or that Valley and Pi and, and Kekel and T looked at was the direct interaction between the brain and the brain in this in this throat region. And and what they found is that the because of the warping, the force is exponentially suppressed, and this ether parameter is effectively zero. Yeah. Or it's extremely small. Yeah. Um, so this is the first contribution to the potential. But that contribution basically ignores that one is living in a compact space. This, strictly speaking, this throat solution is, is taken to be an infinite throat, cut off at arbitrarily at some large radius. Yeah. Um, but if one imagine that one adds a, a finite region to this throat, then as I mentioned, there's a back reaction between the, the energy density in the brain and the overall volume of the compact space. Gravitationally, just <coughs> the volume has to respond when the brain is moving. And as the volume is responding, it, it, it exerts a gravitational force on the brain in some sense. In a sense, for dimensional gravity, there's. Hmm? Without doing to the big one, the hour, there is no four dimensional gravity. Yeah, the back one will be infinite. Yeah, so if you, if you lose the dimensional, the four dimensional gravity, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that emergence effectively introduces this extra mass term. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, it introduces this mass term with a fixed computa uh, computable um, coefficient, with a fixed mass. And in fact, it show, one can show that no matter this mass is, 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 is always large, and the eta, pro eta parameter is, is, is a fixed number, two thirds. Yeah. So that's a, that's a generic term that appears just from the fact that, that one is living in a, in a, in a finite space. Um, and that contribution here is unremoved. It's not even tunable. It's just a fixed, fixed number. Yeah. It's just a fixed mass. Um, so then the next thing that people were speculating about and we now looked at in detail is what actually happens when you effectively really glue this into, into a throat, into a, when you glue this throat into a body region. So what the gluing will do is, is that it will actually perturb the geometry in, at this large radius end. Yeah. So there will be, the, the, there will be small perturbations to the geometry that will then um, be transmitted into the inside region of the, of the light. Yeah. 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 Those will also lead to a solid yeah. um, Okay. Um, so what we looked at is basically at these UV perturbations to the throat geometry, and not just the geometry, also to the flux fields that are inside the throat, and see how all perturbations of all these fields that are relevant to the throat regions can be communicated to and the idea is that those those perturbations will lead to extra <coughs> might lead to extra forces on the brain. And the question is whether that extra force can lead to a correction to the ether parameter. But first of all, it's negative. Yeah. So one thing one could find is that this correction is always positive, and then you you would never be able to to do a cancellation. Yeah? So people have then always assumed implicitly that this correction is negative, but it was never shown. Yeah? Um, and also we uh, also one one can test whether this correction is of the right order to cancel it. Another failure mode could have been if this correction is somehow suppressed, yeah. so that it's never of order one, so then neutron would still be left with a large, large ether parameter. Um, so what we set out to do is basically compute this in a, um, in a systematic way that is applicable to, you know, the, to a very large class of, of these kind of geometries. 
So this delta V here, just to be clear about it, you know, includes all corrections to the tension that come from the fact that it's co it's connected to a finite to, to a compact space, and the, this connection introduces perturbations at the at the large radius end. Um, okay. Um, so the basic strategy is that we know the explicit solution for a warp probe region that is non-compact. Yeah? So before it's attached, you know, before one imagines that it emerges from a compact space, um, um, one has this explicit metric solution, as I mentioned. Yeah? Um, but then, so what we then study now is, is perturbations to that metric and perturbations to the flux field that arise from the fact that it's attached to a, to a compact space. Yeah? So what I will first do is I will describe this in, in uh, on the in, as a gravity calculation. Um, and then talk a little bit about the ph ph phenomenology of the emergent potentials. But then I will also show that there's, that there's a, and probably very briefly, I, I will discuss that there's a <coughs> connection between a gravity solution and a dual gauge theory solution. But there's a famous result due to Malacena called ADS-CFT duality, um, which showed that in fact, um, for certain type of geometries, gravity calculations can be completely equivalent to, to gauge theory calculations without gravity. If, it, if this didn't make sense to you, now I can uh, I'll give you a picture. Picture in a moment. Okay. But first, this 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 computation will be purely gravitational. Um, so, um, so as I mentioned, string theory has a metric and it has fluxes, um, and in fact, it has many of them. So one might worry that you know there are many perturbations to consider, and then all these perturbations could come in a complicated way interact with the brain. Um, but luckily, it turns out that the D3 brain only couples to a very specific combination of perturbations. Yeah? Um, so not any odd perturbation actually has an effect on the D3 brain. There are lots of perturbations that simply have no effect. Yeah? So the, the perturbations could be whatever they would, would like to be, the, the D3 brain would just not feel it. Yeah? And so in particular, if I write down the metric, so this is now a 10-dimensional metric. Um, so for this warped throat region, the metric would take this form. Yeah? So there's a six-dimensional throat, there's our four-dimensional space-time and there's a warp factor linking the two. Yeah? And these y coordinates are basically like the radial coordinates of this throat. Yeah? So the coordinates of the x dimensions. And this warp factor here just depends on the coordinate of the x dimension. Yeah? Um, and then there's a five dimensional flux yeah? that depends on also uh, on, a, on a scalar function of that extra dimensional parameter. Yeah? So it just turns out um, that the, the potential for the D3 brain is simply the difference of those two scalar functions the warp factor and <coughs> this flush function. Yeah. So the details here are really not important. The only point is there could have been, in principle, there are you know, 10 different types of fields and perturbations of each of these fields. But it turns out that the D3 brain only comes to one particular scalar combination of these perturbations. Yeah. Um, so the object we would like to understand is this difference of a warp factor and a flux, um, a flux function. And the idea is that this, this uh, perturbation to this object is, is induced by coupling the throat to a compact geometry. Yeah? So if one were to study just this, this throat without any perturbations to the UV, this object is in fact zero. Yeah? And the D3 brain, in the absence of anything else, yeah, a sim single D3 brain in such a throat wouldn't feel any force. Yeah? Um, so we're now looking at the type of forces that are induced with, when this condition here, the fact that this object here is zero is broken. So the way to compute this is one looks at the, the gravitational, the Einstein equation basically that these fluxes, these perturbations here uh, satisfy. And it's actually just the Einstein equation reduced to a simple Laplacian. Yeah? And this is now a Laplacian in six dimensional space. Yeah? So it's a 6D Laplacian equation that we would like to solve. Okay? Um, and so it's just a little bit more complicated than doing you know, a problem in, in Jackson for electron dynamics. Where on solves, you know, three-dimensional Laplacians for some complicated boundary conditions. And here the problem is very similar. It's just that when one has a complicated five-dimensional space with one radial, um, one radial dimension, and um, one would like to solve for the scalar harmonic functions on this 5D baseline force. And luckily, even we didn't have to do it ourselves because an Italian group had, had done that uh, in 99 already. So these scalar functions on the base manifold are in fact known. So one can then actually write the solution for this phi minus function as just a harmonic expansion on the, on the base manifold. Yeah? Where one has um, some radial dependence with some scaling, um, scaling factor, and then here just a YLM um, 
harmonic on the five dimensional. In a sense, you could put it in TP spec. Yeah, so this is the exact example. Exact. Yeah. Um, or not we, the carousel right now. We have computed the K spectrum on this five dimensional base manifold. And so these <coughs> L and M coefficients here, uh, or indices, are in fact L, L stands for three indices and M for two. Um, but, but they're very analogous to in, in, in two D, in, on a two dimensional sphere, one has these wild M's with L and M angular, quant uh, angular quantum numbers. And here just we have like higher dimensional generalizations of those, those quantum numbers. Um, and then this, importantly, the scaling function here is determined by, these, by the quantum numbers of these, of these harmonics. Yeah? So each, each spherical harmonic is associated with some particular scaling of the radial function. Yeah? But it's just determined by the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of the 5D. The 5D Laplacian. Yeah? So that's, it's, it's just a higher dimensional version of something very similar. Um, and then the group theory selection rules for which of these quant which combinations of quantum numbers are actually allowed. And so really our ultimate goal is to figure out what's the leading, the leading term. And the leading term will be the one with the smallest value of this, this eigenvalue. Because if one imagines normalizing this thing in the UV, um, then the higher this value is, the quicker this radial function will die off when, and or before it reaches the brain. Yeah? So we would like to identify the smallest possible eigenvalue consistent with selection rules of this, these quantum numbers. Yeah? And one finds is the two lowest eigenvalues are these two. So there's a delta of three halves and then there's a delta of two, and corresponding to those particular combinations of, of quantum numbers. Yeah. And so if delta is three halves, then this potential here scales as r to the three halves. Um, if delta is two, the potential just scales as a good value. Yeah. But importantly, this, 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 this computation reduced to like a group theory exercise with, um, with a solution of the Laplacian. So these two cases then lead to two distinct, two distinct shapes for the potential. The first shape is where the leading correction is just this three halves. Um, and the second is when it, it's, it turns out it's also easy to actually forbid this three halves correction. Okay. So if in fact some of the isometries are unbroken, that, that, that left was mentioned, if some of those were unbroken, then it could be that you know, this, this three halves perturbation is actually forbidden by symmetry. Um, and if it's forbidden by symmetry, then the next leading correction will just be this, this quadratic correction. So there are two cases depending on whether symmetries forbid this three halves or not. If there's no symmetries forbidding the three halves, the leading correction is this. If there's a symmetry, just a single discrete symmetry forbidding the three halves, then the next leading correction will be a quadratic. Okay. Yeah. So the full potential in the case where there's a three half correction will look something like this, or can be tuned to something like this. And in fact, it has this inflection point feature. So inflation will be able to occur just around this small region where the um, the potential, in fact, changes curvature. And because, because it changes curvature, it has zero, zero, zero eta here. Are you just ignoring the, the, what the Coulomb piece? Hmm? The Coulomb? Well, yeah, the Coulomb piece is here approximated as a constant. Okay. Because as I said, it was very, uh, as we saw, it was very flat here. I could have included it as, as a one minus one over five to the fourth. Okay. Um, but that's not a big effect. Right? Um, so yeah, this, this first piece is the Coulomb piece. The second piece is this universal mass <coughs> that one always gets. This third piece is the piece, the leading correction coming from the fact that we'll lose it into it. Uh, what happened with the quadratic correction in this uh, uh, extra term? So why is that? He's mean, meaning the form of that. No, the form of that is this. No, 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 the next one. The next one, yeah. The next one will be also there, but it's suppressed relative to this one. And also relative, yeah, well, relative to this one also, because there's a different scale. These, these are normalized in a different way. Okay. So this one is normalized with respect to the plant mass. Right. This one is normalized relative to the UV okay. cutoff scale. Um, but actually, yeah, it's, it's still interesting to me actually to add two or more of these corrections. Uh, and you also notice that actually the, the angular dependence has disappeared. So now this, you know, when I first computed this correction, it was actually a correction that depended on both radius and angles with the spherical harmonics that we know. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that one can prove that when one minimizes in the angular direction, one always gets this minus sign. Yeah. One always gets a repulsive force. Yeah. Which is actually lucky because one could have found the opposite. If one had found the opposite that this was always a plus sign, um, then, then this would always be, you know, would just be making it steeper. Yeah. So it was important that we found a minus sign here after we minimized in the angular directions. Yeah. So these are the comments I would like to make about this. The first comment is that one can actually estimate what this coefficient 3 half here is. Yeah. And one can show that it's 
it's tunable over a wide range, but we haven't computed these coefficients in, in much detail. And the sign of the correction comes from minimizing the angles. And, the, and for people who know, the, the shape of this potential is very similar to the shape of a, a different explicit model that we introduced a year ago. Um, okay. And the second case is where we only have the quadratic term. The three halves term is forbidden by symmetry. And then, in fact, now what one has is one can cancel two pure mass terms against each other. Um, and that's, in fact, the kind of model that we, people were imagining at the very beginning after k that we would simply have two mass terms that could be canceled against each other. And then recently, we studied this explicit model where such a cancellation is actually impossible. Okay? But now, in, in, in this generalization of our, of our older work, one finds that um, one can actually in, in, indeed have such a cancellation between mass terms. So, so what I was saying is that in general you should have that and plus and minus three half. Sorry? Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> this minus term is the five to five. Sorry? You should want all this expression. Plus the plus the plus, plus this quadratic. Yeah. What I'm saying is this quadratic is, is suppressed with respect to all uh, of them. Because <laughs> it, because it uh, Oh I understand that, but now those you do consider cases of better in the yeah, so no one can actually, so people have considered previously cases with beta is zero or beta is small. Yeah? And I think this is now actually a justification how such a, how such a beta can in fact arise. Previously we have never seen a computation where such a correction actually, actually appears. So and now we find such a correction can appear if the leading correction is forbidden, forbidden by a global symmetry. Yeah? But the leading symmetry, the leading correction we always found previously was a three halves. And here we found a systematic way of explaining this three halves. And if you skew the parameters one way, it just reduces the beta. Um, so I'm a little bit over time, so I don't want to say too much about that. Maybe, maybe the experts can, we can talk about this a little bit longer. Um, if I get five minutes, I, I finish this. Can I? Five minutes? Okay. okay. Um, okay. Because this, this is actually something. Otherwise, I wouldn't have explained the title of my talk. Yeah. Because the, the, the reason my talk is called holographic systematics is because of this holographic correspondence. Yeah. So there's, it turns out Balasina proved in, in the late 90s uh, like a beautiful connection between field theory and gravity. Um, and what he proved is uh, uh, that there's a cor holographic correspondence between a theory of gravity and five dimensions. Yeah. Where the five dimensional space is, a, um, it, it is we can call it anti dissipative space. Yeah. So it's a space with negative cosmological constant, yeah? most symmetric space with negative cosmological constant. And it turns out anti dissipative space has a, has a, has a boundary. Yeah? Um, and then, so what he then did is he studied gauge theories on that boundary. And he can show that any question you can ask on the boundary, you know, as, as a gauge theory question without any gravity whatsoever, uh, can, be re can be related one to one to a question that can be um, to physics inside the, um, inside the space. So there's this holographic correspondence between gauge theories on the boundary of ADS space um, and quantum gravity or string theory inside the, inside the space. Yeah. Um, and the reason this is relevant for us is because actually these throat solutions turn out to be very close and very close relatives to these ADS spaces that, um, that Malvasino was studying. And in fact, there, there also exist for these throats yeah, explicit correspondences to, to, to gauge theories. Yeah. And any, yeah. So, to a good approximation, this <coughs> is in fact an ADS space, and any deviation from an ADS space has actually been understood in terms of a deviation from the actual gauge theory that one seen in study. So the advantage of that correspondence is that sometimes calculations are hard on this on, the, on this side of the correspondence as a gravity calculation. For example, when black you know very near to a black hole, you know singularity. Um, or sometimes a the field theory calculation is hard because you know you, have, you want to compute something at strong coupling, um, and it turns out that whenever one calculation is hard, the other one is easy. Yeah? Um, so a strong coupling calculation in the field theory corresponds to a weakly curved space um, on, on the gravity side. And so one can actually use the, one of the powerful ways of using the correspondence is to translate questions from one theory to another theory. Uh, um, whenever one is hard, the other one is easy. So that's why, so what I presented so far was, was, was just the gravity side of the calculation. And I showed you how these corrections to the potential relate to eigenvalues of Laplacians, where this coordinate phi is the radius of the throat, this, this cutoff scale phi uv is the maximum radius of the throat. Um, but now, because of this duality between 
gravity calculations and gauge theory calculations, we can also translate this whole calculation into a gauge theory, into a gauge theory quantities. Yeah. So for example, one can relate this correction to the potential, this phi minus in particular, um, to, to very specific corrections to the, the gauge theory Lagrangians, the gauge theory operators. Um, now this delta dimension will actually correspond to the operator dimension. This phi will be the energy scale of the, 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 the gauge theory, and this phi will be, will be the color scale. Um, so we can redo the calculation on this side, basically, and compare if the answer, if the answer holds. Yeah. Um, OK, so I just referred to uh, In the paper, we give details on this, actually. Um, actually works out quite nicely. And and that's just credit to Mandacino, of course. And it's, it's just one of many hundreds of examples now where the correspondence actually works. So you would have been very surprised and pretty if this hadn't worked and you know, blamed ourselves to begin with. Um, but, but luckily, this actually worked out in, in detail. Um, OK, so I want to stop here just reminding you that I pointed out three questions in inflation that are sensitive to UV physics. And I like to use these three questions to motivate studying inflation in the context of string theory. Um, because, in, I mean, to my mind at least, you know, strength it provides the most promising framework to address these questions. Um, and in the case of gravitational waves and non-Gaussianity, um, it might even be the fact that, that very soon these, these things might be forced on us by observations. Yeah? So if you were to see gravity waves or non-Gaussianity, we'd really have to you know, ask, ask kind of theories how to explain this from our microscopic point of view. Thanks a lot. from a um, from a perturbation that where um, the dimension is not protected. 
the, for a long time we were actually trying to find this, this quadratic, this universal quadratic correction in our spectrum of correlations. Yeah. Well, we actually didn't, we, we, there is no such, there's this other quadratic correction that we found, but it turns out, you know, for detailed, for detailed reason, that quadratic correction is not this, this, this universal, it doesn't have the right symmetries. Um, and um, so, but of course, you know, when one, when one looks at the gate, on, on the gauge theory, there, there are different classes of operators, some of which have protected dimensions and some of which don't have protected dimensions. It turns out these leading corrections that we were looking at co all come from chiral operators which have protected dimensions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can actually read off the dimension at a cla classical level and treat them and, and, and trust them at, at any level. It turns out this universal mass direction is not of that sort. It doesn't have a mass dimension we which can just read off. But we can, we can argue that it's present, but it's, it's, it has a renormalized mass yeah. dimension. Okay, we're done.